This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. On Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, you get information about foods you should eat to stay in good health and tips on how to stay active. I'm Josie Bidwell, host of Southern Remedy Healthy and Fit, an associate professor of preventive medicine at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Listen to the show every Monday at 11 or subscribe to the podcast by searching for Southern Remedy with your preferred podcasting app. Good morning and thanks for listening. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress, professor of pediatrics at the University of Mississippi Medical Center. Today we're talking about social norms. Okay, you may wonder why we're talking about that today, but but it's really something that is happening to us um, all the time, changes in those. So from time to time, you know, over our lifespan, there have been really pre- pretty significant changes in social normative behavior, social roles, the way we should or should not behave. And, you know, we'll talk some about what causes those changes. But today we'll also talk about how much things have changed. And is this vastly different in our lifetimes as compared to the way our parents went through social change as they were growing up. You know, maybe, maybe not. Before we get into that, though, let me sort of clarify what we're talking about. Social norms are the informal rules that sort of govern our behavior and the way we act in groups, in societies. They're pretty much unwritten rules. Now, sometimes we may write some of this down, but it's it's just the way we behave and it's the way things are formed as we live our lives and as people either approve or disapprove of the way the behavior's going for the masses, okay? So it's rules of beliefs, attitudes um, that are considered acceptable in in our particular social group our culture. So those social norms aren't the same, obviously, all over the world. It depends on, on culture, right? And it depends on upbringing. So there may be some vast differences even in the U.S. And I'm sure as we talk through this, um, some of you who did not grow up in the South may have moved to the South or moved from another country and there were pretty significant different social normative behaviors. And so, you know, as we're, we're talking about social normative behavior, there's social rules, and they change, change along as, as we just progress in our lives, okay? Uh, Actually, um, as I was looking into this topic, I think those of you who listened to the radio show last week probably know that that I had actually planned on doing it last week until my computer decided to disrupt my plans, which happens sometimes when we become very, very dependent on our electronic um, friends. But anyway, today, as, as I was looking through this a couple of weeks ago, I, I ran across some lines written by William Shakespeare, William Shakespeare and his play uh, called As You Like It. And Jacques says, says something during that play that I think kind of sets what we're talking about. Um, he says, all the world's a stage, and all the men and women merely players. They have their exits and their entrances, and one man in his time plays many parts. So I think that says something very well for me in that it says, you know, the part we played back 20, 30 years ago may be a very different part that we play now. So before we keep going and get to the next um, piece of this, I just want to remind you that there are other changes 
um, that occur that are part of our social normative behavior, and those are um, grammatical changes. You know, social social normative behavior is kind of like grammar or social interactions, um, and but but as we're talking about those social normative changes. Our grammar has changed, and we'll talk about that in just a few minutes. But before, I want to go right to the phones. We have David from Horn Lake. Hey, David, thanks for joining us early. Well, I'd like to make a comment about, especially with the holiday coming right up now, about how the the, the values have changed so much and the family unit has changed so much. Uh, mm. the, with, with, with the easy divorce... And one of my nephews been married three times. They got three different babies by three different marriages and whatnot. And uh, uh, with the um, dumbing down or the trash commercial TV or whatnot, like uh, they got multiple shows on paternity court and who's the daddy. And they've made it to where having a child and raising a child and, and, you know, a two-parent family is essentially meaningless and you can, whatever feels good, do it. Don't worry about the social ramifications and the long-term ramifications about the family or whatnot. And uh, it just seems like it's uh, anything goes. And if it feels good, do it now. And don't worry about it because, um, you know, you can get welfare. If you can't feed one child, don't worry. Don't worry about having two, three, and four because, you know, anyway, that's all I got to say. Wow, David, he brought up some I think some actually very important topics. Um, one of them, one of them that you mentioned at the beginning is family, and the fact that there seems to be in some areas less emphasis on the importance of family and family gathering and family loyalty and the like. And you know, part of part of the issue is that. We are such a mobile society now. We travel um, about. We don't grow. We don't work where we grew up many times, and so uh, families often aren't near enough each other to be able to gather. The other thing that's one group, and and I will say some of my very best memories were growing up around a dinner table and just sitting for a couple of hours, maybe three at times, just talking, talking with each other, catching up with each other. And I I hope some families are still doing that. Ours ours is. Um, I'm so looking forward. My siblings, um, I have I have seven siblings. They and their families are gathering together at our home place um, where we grew up, and we are all uh, going to sit around a meal. And it's noisy and crazy and chaotic, but it keeps us connected. Now, the other thing, David, that David mentioned is something that I am happy to talk about <laughs> over and over again, and that is the value or maybe the lack that some people feel in the value of their children and the lack that it almost in in some areas does seem that we don't have the de- dedication to our children and that now now David was talking about welfare i will say that that happens in the rich and the poor families where everybody's so involved in the me of things and everybody is so involved in taking care of themselves now and we're so worried about what is fashion and what relationship is best for us that we forget about those little beings that we brought into the world. And I I dare say there are plenty of kids who have enough food on the table and enough money for clothes, but they don't have the emotional support they need. I'm just throwing that out there because I, I'm i just tagging on to some of what David said. So, David, I don't know if you had anything else to say um, about this. I know it sounded like there was something real emotional um, in this for you. Thanks for the call. 
All right. Well, thank you for calling. I, I know that that as we're talking through this, the some of what is accepted as social normative behavior over the years has has not always been the right kind of behavior. And I'd love to hear from you about, you know, where when were what was good about the good old days? What was bad? What needed to change? I'll bring up some of those changes in a few minutes, but feel free to jump in anytime. You can send an email to family at mpbonline.org. Okay. Um, let's talk just for a minute about some of the grammatical changes that have happened. And I'll say some of this uh, rang pretty true. Some of the the grammatical changes are even pronunciation changes, like um, people dropping the T's in the middle of words, like now they say important instead of important. Um, that drives me crazy. I just want to say that. Please put your but T's you never in. sounded more hip than you did just a second ago. <laughs> did I sound never. hip? You did. Oh. You sounded really important. Uh, important? Important. Ah. Uh. Okay, well, you won't he hear me saying that on purpose, <laughs> but thank you for telling me I sounded hip, Jay. And that's it. I don't <laughs> think people use the word hip anymore, but yeah. No, I don't think so. Right. <laughs> I don't think so. Okay, I picked a few of my favorites that have been added to the Merriam-Webster Dictionary in 2022. And the way they're added, by the way, is they have to be used a substantial number of times and be used in citations, too, okay? So, um, adorkable, adorkable. Do you know what that means? That is the first time I've ever heard that. Uh, and uh, I have teenagers. Uh, well, ask them what adorkable means. It means that you're socially awkward or quirky, but it's very endearing. Okay. So. Okay, yeah. Maybe I could be adorkable, right? I've probably, yeah. <laughs> I've probably been adorkable, I guess. Maybe, I don't know. Okay, this is one that um, I thought it was not a nice term, um, but apparently the way it was added in the dictionary, baller, baller. <laughs> Oh, no, I thought that wasn't a nice term, but it's excellent or exciting. No, no, that's great. That's a good one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. If yeah. you're balling, you're you're doing well. Yeah, yeah. And that can apply in a whole bunch of different directions. Okay. Yeah. Learning stuff. Yeah. <laughs> janky. <laughs> oh man, we got some janky stuff here at MPB. Yeah. Well, no, we don't. Of poor quality. Everything's of great quality, right? Yeah. A little bit janky every now and then, but. Well, we bought some. Uh, I think we bought some webcams from Amazon or something like that. Oh yeah. They weren't branded, so we called them janky brand. That gives you an idea about how well they worked. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and the last one. I, I truly think everybody knows this, and I use it very often. MacGyver. 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 So to make or repair something with items that are conveniently at hand. Yeah. So You MacGyvered it. I MacGyvered yeah. it. Yeah. And, um, and I, then I the, fixed a PlayStation one time with, with a a big pin top. There you go. That was MacGyvering. That was MacGyvered. Yeah. yeah, it was MacGyvering. So, okay, last one, Space Force. That's a brand new. Space Force. Space Force. The military organization of a nation for space warfare. Oh, my goodness. Okay. <laughs> yeah, our former president, I think, created that one. That's out there. Yeah, that's out there. Okay, well, I'm going to stop Literally. there. and um, I get new ones all the time, though. Like my daughter, she says slay all the time right there. Uh, and so I'm like, what? What is slay? Like you're out there slaying like a beast, I guess. I don't know. Does slay mean that's really good? You yes. did it? Like you you're killing it. it. You're, you're killing, killing it if you're slaying it. it. Yeah. That's S-L-A-Y, and, I, and, and sometimes I'll text it to her, but I'll – Spell it S L E I G H, like sleigh bells. I'll misspell it on purpose oh. and it sets her off. I, I trigger her when That's, I misspell it. That I, is I, adorable, Jay. It is adorable. <laughs> isn't it? I'm trying to smash as many of these into the one story as I possibly can. <laughs> and embarrass her as much as possible. <laughs> okay, we've got some callers I want to get to. Debbie Vale and 
someone else. Um, But we are talking about social normative behavior, grammatical changes over the years, what's good and what's bad. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress with Jay White, and we're talking about social normative behavior, social grammar, What's acceptable, what's not. We're going to go right on back to the phones. We have Debbie in Hattiesburg about mental wellness of children. Hey, Debbie, thanks for calling. Hi, doctor. I wanted, as a pediatrician, for you to address how important it is or what your thoughts are about supporting families and children who might not be from what some people might think is a traditional background, but they are coming from alternative or ethnic cultures or um, they've got lifestyles that might be a little different or they might have special needs and how things today, the normative changes that we've experienced is to not be so um, oppressive and suppressive of children and what they're going through if it's not what some in the community might call traditional. Uh, The importance of mental wellness in our children, their behavioral health, Um, and their mental health and how critical that is for society to thrive. Thank you. Oh, Debbie, um, you brought up a topic near and dear to my heart. Um, Mental wellness is one of those issues that we really should be thinking about for our children from the very, very beginning. Did anybody out there know? I know a few people do because I've talked with them about this. Did anyone know that there are are mental health services and emotional health services for very young children. We work with new mothers on how to assure the mental wellness of their infants. The emotional attachment, the social-emotional attachment, that interaction is so very important. So just wanted to just say, in general, it's from the very beginning. We forget about that. We often think about mental health only for adults. But the very young child can be depressed. The very young child can suffer from attachment issues. So that's one thing. The other thing that Debbie mentioned is hopefully one of the things that has changed over the years is is the acceptance of diversity the accept, un, the understanding of the and and the acceptance that there are different cultures and and there there are so many different variations of what can be typical and then if there's a child or an adult who is atypical in their development in any way to accept them them and to embrace them because the lack of acceptance and embracing is very damaging to the mental wellness of of individuals if you think about it So the next time you see somebody, this is just a suggestion, the next time you see somebody, for example, in a wheelchair, don't turn away and be embarrassed. Turn turn forward. Look at them. Make eye contact with them. Say, hello, how are you? Or say, hello, what a beautiful day it is, isn't it? Or whatever. But learn to get comfortable with those individuals. Remember that just because an individual has a disability doesn't mean they don't have good cognitive function. And I think many times, particularly, um, a lot of people forget that many, many individuals with, for example, cerebral palsy or a Some sort of physical disability, who is in a wheelchair on crutches, um, has some spasticity. Many times those individuals have normal cognitive learning intelligence, okay? So to, to treat them like they're typical people, treat them as you would your best friend. I think really important to keep that in mind. Our world would be such a better place. So... Thank you for that, Debbie. You brought, like I said, a topic up that's very near to to my heart. Um, let's stay on the phones. Vale's been waiting for a bit in Yazzie City. Hi. Thanks for calling. Oh, hi. Thank you. What I wanted to say is not deep, but um, I, uh, something that aired on NPR, it was really it's so funny. It was strange to me. 
oh, somebody threw a party, and then they billed the guests, and they texted them that they owed so much money on the party. You know, that's really uh, made me aghast. And another thing is uh, I have to watch myself because I lived outside of the South for several years, and I have a friend who was a stay-at-home mom most of her life, and uh, so I know I I picked up being more direct mm-hmm. than a lot of Southerners are, and sometimes she'll call me on it. But two, I think uh, she stayed at home so long that that uh, she wasn't, which is okay, but she wasn't up on a lot of the changes that were going on mm-hmm. out in the world, <laughs> and. Um, that's mainly what I had to say, but I was aghast when I heard they threw that party <laughs> and then build a guest, and then by text. Oh, my so goodness. Oh, that's my. not deep, but those are my comments. Well, thanks, Val. I, you know, that, obviously, I will say, that shouldn't be if anybody thinks it's social normative behavior. If you If you are asking people to pay for something, do it on the front end. Let them know that you're invited, but this will cost $15 a person or whatever. But never, never, ever should that be acceptable on the back end. You know, I have seen where individuals have been, for example, here's another one that someone seemed to be aghast on, is that um, people were invited to a wedding. And they said, and, and the the people, the couple who sent the invitation said, in lieu of um, presents, we would like money. I mean, it was basically a monetary request um, instead of a gift. And so I, I know a few people who were aghast at that. But in some cultures, apparently that is very acceptable. And so, you know, it's it's what's acceptable and, and what's what's not and in the culture in which you are so we want to make sure that you don't step out of normative behavior for something like that um if if it's if it's not acceptable unless you just really don't care um and you're going to do it anyway but that's that's one of those things that I don't think is acceptable billing afterwards. I'd love to hear if anyone thinks that might be acceptable. I guess if there were some really inappropriate behavior or someone broke something, um, perhaps. But even in that case, it'd probably take a phone call and not a, a text. So thanks for that, Vail. <laughs> that's a... Interesting. The other thing that that Vale said, too, is directness. So if you uh, in the South so many times people do sort of skirt around and and I will say I did grow up in the South and I've only lived uh, for a few years in Texas outside of Mississippi, actually. But I am one of those individuals who who tries if there's a an issue, I'm pretty direct. Sometimes it does hit people hard. But I try to do it in a kind way. Um, Now, no, I don't end, bless your heart, after everything. But I do do try when I say something and I'm trying to be direct about it and honest about it that I say it kindly. So that is, I think, direct and being kind can happen at the same time. I think that... If you're going to say something to one's face, you ought to try to be able to say it uh, clearly. If you're going to say it to their back and then something totally different to their face, is that really fair? So directness seems to be more fair as long as you are direct and kind and think about another person's feelings. So... I hope that made sense, Vale, and I hope that's kind of where you were coming from, too. Yeah, thank you. Okay, well, thank you for your call. Well, let's stay on the phone. Ben now has been waiting a while. Ben from Madison, I want to hear about your family value thoughts. 
yeah, I, my question, or co- I have more of a comment and I guess question mm-hmm. based on the gentleman's call earlier. You know, I'm in my 40s, and I think that my grandparents, and I, I'm asking about the cultural changes on how we balance family and success. And I, I think about back to my grandparents who grew up pretty poor, which means I guess my parents grew up pretty poor, but they they trained me. They're the kind of parents who took the extra work, took the extra call um, to try to be more successful than their parents. And here I am now doing the same thing, missing out on family activities, uh, doing way better than my parents had ever done financially when I was the same age as my children. I would say the word balling, to use what you were talking about earlier. Uh-huh. Um, but as a joke, I'm just kidding. But, <laughs> that was um, good. <laughs> I, uh, and, and I guess what I'm trying to ask, and maybe an, 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 someone my parents' age could call in in their 60s, 70s, were they thinking the same thing 30 years ago? Would they be making the same comment on how they, were, they feel like, I'm working too hard to, for this success to to miss out on family stuff because I'm afraid to fail. I'm afraid to be poor again. Is this a Southern mentality or is this nationwide? How we're just, I, I, I really do not turn down work mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. the fear of, of never having it again, or the fear of loss or the fear of being poor or running out of money. I did go out on my own when I was younger and had this, had the, you know, had to try to live, day to day, you know, mm-hmm. and I've been kind of there when I was alone. But now I have a family to take care of, I have responsibilities, I have employees. And I guess I guess I'm making a statement and asking or we're creating this culture and we're creating a a bad family atmosphere, but but we're trying to be we're trying to do good but making it worse. Does that make sense? We're trying to it does. build success but we're not able to achieve everything we need to, especially if you're starting something from scratch or what, where, what's the end goal? I guess yeah. Is yeah. Uh-huh. Ben, um, you know, I bet there, there are several of us who have experienced the same thing you have. Okay. Um, for example, my grandparents on both sides were immigrants from, um, Lebanon, the old country, as they called it. And um, they, particularly my father's uh, father, uh, came over at 17 with just a few dollars in his pocket and peddled and, and worked very, very hard and ultimately was able to open a re- retail business, worked six days a week from 7 o'clock in the morning to 10 at night. And that's the pattern my father grew up in. And, and that's pretty much the pattern he, he fell into himself. And, you know, Dad and I never talked about whether he felt like he was missing out, out on family, but that was kind of a different era when um, I think most men, not all, were not as involved in the family unit as far as running it or anything. It was a woman's job to stay at home. Mm-hmm. And and that's evolved a lot, and and certainly, um, you know, I I though I, I always worked, um, I have always tried hard to make it a point to take time from my family because they're very important to me. My husband and I are partners, truly partners, in in running the household and and he he is an equal partner. I I think Ben, if you if you are falling into that where you are beginning to feel like maybe I'm missing out on something, then I would encourage you to step back, make yourself regroup about the time that you're putting in and make yourself determine whether or not it's really as necessary as as are all those hours really necessary to be successful because the bottom line is if you work maybe i'm not implying that you're not working smart but if you try to work smarter have goals for yourself make yourself determine that you know you're going to work as hard as you can 
for these many hours a day, and then you're going to put it away, and then you're going to go home, and you're going to take the time to be with your family, your spouse, your children, or whomever you want to be with, whether that's just close friends. But but I can tell you, it is it is much, much healthier to learn that balance and to give yourself a buy, allow yourself to have time, and to teach yourself that you should not feel guilty for taking time off to to develop the relationships that you desire to have. Because the very fact that you call tells me that you feel like you might be missing out on something. And that tells yeah. yeah. And so I would yeah. I would encourage you sit down today if you can. Make yourself sit down and write down um, what you think a reasonable work day should be. And then hold yourself to that and tell the people around you, this is this is the new new way I'm doing this. And this is the way you can do it if you have people who work under you. Because working smarter, you know, I think so many times we 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 have been told that if the shift is well, except for something like nursing or emergency room shifts or whatever it to me the way it should be set up is you you get work done reasonable amount of work done in a day and when you finish you're done why why do we feel like we have to fill in so many hours a day to work and so make yourself step back and and figure out how you can have a good, successful work day and still have a happy family life and give the attention to your significant others in your life to enough attention to be able to build a relationship with them. Okay, Ben? Yes, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Promise me you'll try <laughs> that. I think it will be good we'll for try. you. We'll try. It's going to be tough. Okay. All right. All right. Thanks so much for calling. This is Relatively Speaking. I'm Dr. Susan Buttress here with Jay White, my producer. And we are talking about social normative behavior. We've talked about grammatical changes, which is a lot of fun. Some words, nah, but um, those changes happen too. And, and now we're just talking about what's acceptable, what's not, what's good for life. All right. Well, let's go right on back to the phones. We have Mikey from Mobile. Um, hey, Mikey, you want to say another comment or two about accepting people's disabilities? Uh, no, understanding people's uh -huh. disabilities. Yeah. Uh, because I had my eyes open to something that I had not thought about, and I'd like to share it with the general public um, uh, regarding wheelchairs. Mm. Um I had a friend who uh, I still hope I do. I, I don't know. haven't seen him in a long time. But this guy was born with a condition that caused his legs to be underdeveloped. And so he, mm -hmm. had, you know, he, he used a wheelchair as his main uh, way of mobility. Not always. He would get really angry if you wanted to, you know, help him up the stairs. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he just wasn't going to have that. Um he looked like Hercules in the wheelchair. Uh-huh, uh-huh. I mean, this guy was really handsome, really intelligent, really just a great person. I was, I, I am, if he is still available, to have his friendship. Um, but the lesson that he taught me is that uh, we were at a party that was hosted by um, his family. Uh, it was a street party with a jazz band and everything. I mean, this was real upscale <laughs> for me and my my former husband. We were we weren't that upscaled, and we were grateful to be invited. And we were all together, the three of us, and um, cruising up and down the street and listening to the band and talking to the neighbors and having a good time. But and he said to me, "This is the point I'm trying to make." He said to me, "Look, you know, it's like you think you guys could like." Do something that will keep you from being looking up your noses all the time. Hmm. And I thought that, that was an incredible degree of honesty that had never occurred to me before. I mean, I got training in theater. My former husband had um, 
lots of training. He hasn't had a business called Point of View Photography. Um, and, uh, you know, neither of hmm. us have ever thought about that. So, I mean, maybe that wouldn't work for everybody, but that's what he wanted. And I never thought about, you know. So he wanted you to sit I'm down now, and, I yeah. Get a chair and sit next to him or kneel down if I, at most days I could, um, you know, whatever. But, yeah, looking up somebody's noses is probably not that much fun. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think it would be. Well, OK. Coming from a person who is a little bit ver- vertically challenged, I, I I probably not that I have full understanding. But, yeah, I, I know my son-in-law. I have a son-in-law who is six five and I am stretching saying I'm five feet tall and so he often does kind of squat down by me when he's talking to me, which is really sweet. Um, he he gets a little bit smaller, so he's not so much bigger than I am. So just to uh, I hear what your friend was saying, just to um, have have someone aware of where you are in in the universe and where your space, your comfortable space is. So that would make sense. But, you know, there, there are certainly wheelchairs now that um, elevate people if you, if you have the money to be able to pull yourself up um, higher. So, Jay? I always do that with pets. I try to get down on pets level. Yeah. When I pet my dogs and stuff like that. You do. Yeah. And you do that with children, too, right? When yeah. you're talking to a young child, you don't stand at your full height and look down at them. I typically squat down and try to get a level. I think it's less intimidating for a, a young child to interact with you. And the same thing with a pet, um, to, to be a little more on their level so that they can feel like they count as much. Right. Yeah. But it's, you know, pets are wild too, because, and, and dogs with their personalities and stuff like that. Because, I mean, I have a dog where if I stick my hand out like overhanded, like he automatically flinches. Something's happened in his oh. life. But if I, if I turn, if I put my hand out underhanded, uh huh, like she goes crazy. Wow. You know, wanting to get pets and stuff like that. And it's coming from the same person standing in the same place in the same way. But like, and yeah. I, I can imagine, especially with kids, how that same logic kind of. Oh, absolutely. Kind of it it really does. And, you know, I've always said behavior, behavior medicine in general works for children, adults, and animals. It, the concept is all the same um, if you just think about it logically. So, Mikey, thanks for that. I appreciate it. All right. Let's stay on the phone. We are going to go to Ron. And, okay, Ron, is it Sat? Saltillo or Saltillo? I always say um, Unless you're Spanish, it's Saltillo. Sa- Saltillo. Okay, thank you. <laughs> I'll work in that. <laughs> now, see, I was going to ask because I've always wondered if it's Saltillo or Saltillo. Like, I've heard it said both ways, and I don't, you know. Well, anyway, if you lived here, you'd be home now. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> I love- you know, Ronnie. Ronnie Agnew is from South Tilla. I know Absolutely. he's not director anymore, but yeah. Yeah. Um, I had a little thing talking about, um, you know, protocols and social norms. I think it was Leslie Stahl years ago on 60 Minutes went to interview Warren Buffett out in his hometown of Omaha. And, um, you know, Buffett's one of the world's richest men. Right. And Buffett said, okay, I'll take you to lunch, my favorite place. He took her to McDonald's. No. Uh, <laughs> and, you know, it, it's, uh, that's Warren Buffett. He, you know, he's one of the more common people. Now, uh, common, so it's, I'm not trying to lay religion on you, but Christ said, what you do for the least of these, you have done for me. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I think, you know, we, we need to, uh, it was drilled into my sister and I's heads when we were kids, to um, anyone who was being made fun of for any reason, whether it was a disability, whether it was a race, whether it was a, a, any kind of problem, you know, we, it was drilled into us to stand up for those people, and, and we have. Um, but, you know, I have a question for you. 
Yeah. Um, I had a botched hip operation, wound up having to have hip replaced three times, Ugh. and I was on a walker for a while. Mm. And, you know, I really appreciated people helping me get indoors and get around. But, you know, out nowadays, I'm just kind of always in a quandary whether a person is um, sight impaired or hearing impaired or they obviously have a physical impairment. I'm always in a quandary of whether to offer help or not. So if you want, if you could talk about that a minute, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, I hear you, um, Ron, and and I think I've kind of brought this up before. Back during the days of the really push for women's rights and equality years ago, when I was uh, a very young woman, I can remember a friend of mine who got so angry when a guy opened the door, held the door open and stepped back for her. And she was, she said, I can do it myself to him and marched off. And then she railed to me about it. And I said, he was just being polite. He was just being, I hold the door open for men behind me. I often hold the door open for older men when they're approaching a door. So I, I think, okay, so my statement to you, Ron, is people who get angry about that kind of thing when someone's being polite just has their head on wrong. It's not okay. So any of you who get insulted when somebody tries to help you, you need to think about what you're getting angry about. You're getting angry about kindness. Okay, so this is what I would do, and this is what I've done. Um, I'll just say that this happened to me not too long ago. I was in a ladies' room, big, big with multiple stalls. And I heard a woman crying, sobbing, sobbing in one of the stalls. And she clearly was just standing in the stall to cry. And it was breaking my heart because it was clear that her heart was broken about something. She was really, really upset about something. And I took a really long time to wash my hands, waiting for her to come out. And she came out and I looked at her and I said, I'm so sorry, you're so sad. Is there anything I can do? And she said, she said, no, no, thank you. And I said, well, I just want you to know I'm sorry that you're sad. And if there's anything I can do, I'll be here for a couple of hours. I was at, at a function. And she looked at me and she said, thank you so much. And she walked out. So she turned me down. But I just felt the need to let her know that I cared. And I, I think the same thing goes. You can. I have asked people before, do you need help with those bags? Do you need, you know, can I get that for you? And sometimes they say, yes, thanks so much. And sometimes they say, no, thank you. Um, so I would just keep being polite. And being helpful and and not allow one unkind frown about you trying to be polite to deter you. That's my thought. What do you think about that, Ron? I think there's not enough common courtesy nowadays. Is there actually, I think that's what you're saying and mm -hmm. that's what I think. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think sometimes, Doctor, I think nowadays people don't really know how to respond when you're courteous. Mm -hmm. uh, but, that, but I appreciate your answer on that. Well, it's just like I, I told one of my girlfriends not too long ago when somebody was complimenting her on her hair, and she started saying everything that was wrong with her hair. I looked at her and I said, just say thank you. Just say thank you. Bingo. <laughs> yeah, bingo. It's such a compliment. Just be human. It's okay. Ryan, yeah, thank you. You too. Happy Thanksgiving, by the way. All right. Well, we have time for another caller. We have Brother Daniel in Pascagoula. Hi, Brother Daniel. Thanks for calling. What's up, Mama Sue? Uh, I've missed hearing from you. you. Oh, we love you. I <laughs> just want to say you all will make Mississippi beautiful. 
Uh-huh. I wish I could vote for you, but we need you right where you at. Uh-huh. So I get people to call in and talk and find a simple way of living. Okay. My comment is, here's my comment. Okay. Good food, good love, good communication, and learning about each other's culture is what's going to make Mississippi strong and make our life strong and be able to be there for one another. That's my comment for this Thanksgiving, because this is what Thanksgiving is about. Amen? Amen. That's beautiful, Brother Daniel. And I, I think that maybe in the last couple of minutes, I'd like to just take off in your point. And you you mentioned the word culture. I think so many times we talk about race when we should be talking about culture. Race is sort of a social construct. I mean, we're all different colors. You know, we are. Different shades of whatever. So, but we're not, but there are differences in culture and cultural upbringing. So it's really important to learn about each other. It It is so good for, for us as far as just being those kind human beings, as Ron and I were talking about a few months, minutes ago. To, to be that kind in individual who does take the time to know about each other, who does take the time to learn what's important to you. Um, you know, if there's an individual with special needs, to find out. What makes them feel good? What makes them happy? If there is an individual who has suffered a loss, take time to listen to them and understand what they're feeling right now. Um, So, you know, we've had a show uh, previously about being a good listener and As we approach this Thanksgiving uh, coming up in a couple of days, I think it would be really, really important to look up what it means to be a good listener. And it basically means to look somebody in the eye and really hear them, really, really hear all the words that they're saying And that way, when you do, and if you then turn around and perhaps ask them to expand on something that you heard that you find interesting, you know what that does to that individual. It makes them feel valued. It makes them feel like you think they're important enough to listen and then to find out more about them. So. That would be a good thing to do this Thanksgiving. I would encourage you to all listeners be safe, travel safely. Please don't drink and drive. Please don't drink and drive. Please don't text and drive. So I reached an accident that I am sure was secondary to that texting and driving. So don't do it. All right. Southern Remedies, a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting Think Radio and funded is provided in part by a grant from the University of the uh, Mississippi Medical Center and support from our listeners. I hope you'll listen to other podcasts and past episodes. You can do that on your favorite podcast app by such, searching Southern Remedy, relatively speaking. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or 